What difference does a party make? This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk about what's happening in the UK, where one of the two parties in what is basically a two-party system is picking up many of the radical demands coming out of movement groups seeking to transform the economy. Will they take that agenda with them into office? Nobody knows, but they're having meetings with activists like this one all across the country from Imperial College London. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In June 2017, mainstream media predicted that the Labour Party would be crushed in the UK's general election. Instead, it won its best result in 20 years, getting more than 40% of the vote under the leadership of a lifelong socialist anti-war campaigner, Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn didn't become prime minister, but he did come close to unseating conservative Theresa May after just two years as Labour Party leader. You could almost hear the reporter's surprise. Well, he has not won the election, but this has been a nice vindication for Jeremy Corbyn, defying his critics with Labour's best result for almost 20 years. It gives me great pleasure, it gives me great pleasure to invite the leader of the Labour Party, the person who's going to take us into number 10, Jeremy Corbyn. Last time we were here, I talked about the dire state of our economy under the Tories, and that was two years ago. And sadly, in the two years since then, things have got even worse. Wages are lower than they were in 2016, at the time of the last conference, and lower they were than they were in real terms a decade ago. The Tories have shown they have no response to these deep structural problems, and they are very, very deep. They continue in instead to subscribe to the highly discredited theory that economic growth will mean trickle down and help those at the bottom. It didn't work under Thatcher, it isn't working under May. In terms of when we go into government as the, the Labour Party, the Labour Party now is a social movement. It isn't a small party. We're, we're the largest political party in Western Europe. 550,000 members and still growing. So we have a huge body of expertise. That party membership now isn't just mobilised to get the vote out of elections. That's the traditional role of political parties. We've gone well beyond that. That party membership now are involved in the debate and discussion of policies involved in campaigning within their local communities, so all those doorstep conversations, conversations at the school gates, in the, in the pubs and clubs, etc. Then that's the way we mobilise now as a party. So their ideas then get implemented by the local council, but implemented by national government as well. So we have, like we're having today, we have these conferences which are packed out, where people are creative in their ideas, and they then get developed into policies in, in detail that we can implement in government itself. That's the first thing. So the party itself, the party mechanism. The second is that actually what we're trying to do now is make sure the party is completely opened out to the community. So our community meetings now, town meetings, etc., and not just for our party members, but for everybody else. So we target particular groups as well, particularly those on, who are campaigning on particular issues, whether it's trying to save their health service or their local school. And again, we're saying to them, we're alongside the trade unions as well, what ideas have you got? How do you think we can tackle that particular problem? And by the way, we'll set up structures to enable you to take the decisions and implement those policies as well. That means reinvigorating local government in particular, but also looking at new structures too. We're here today at the State of the Economy conference organised by Labour. So Labour's thinking big about what the future of the economy looks like. My background's in campaigning for better trains. I was really frustrated at the effect that privatisation was having on passengers, on services, and I wanted to set up an organisation that would make the case for public ownership in a positive, forward-looking way. Labour's manifesto, which was this time a year ago, uh, promised to bring uh, water, energy, rail, Royal Mail into public ownership. And that's really you know, ignited a conversation in the UK about public ownership and what that means and how it could work and how we could get there. No one had any idea that Labour would do this turnaround, you know, that they'd go from, from, from a personal perspective, being, you know, quite Blairite and wishy-washy and not really standing for anything and saying, well, you know, whatever works is fine, to something where we're, at, you know, Labour is actually defending public services, the principle of public services, the idea that they should be owned by all of us. So the recent polling suggests 83% of us want publicly owned water, 77% for energy, 76% for the railway. So people really feel that these are things that should belong to all of us. 
Interest in public ownership may be gaining steam, but it's not new in the UK. Under Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee, key British industries were nationalised in the 1940s, but they were sold back into private hands in the 1980s and 90s, and the trend towards privatisation continued until recently under both Conservative and Labour leaders, notably Tony Blair. Let us never forget this fundamental truth. The state has no source of money other than the money people earn themselves. If the state wishes to spend more, it can do so only by borrowing your savings or by taxing you more. And it's no good thinking that someone else will pay. That someone else is you. There is no such thing as public money. There is only taxpayers' money. Thatcher changed this country, but not irrevocably. Thatcher attacked what she called the culture of entitlement. The welfare state in this country meant you were entitled to have help if you needed it. She said no. You know, she said, no, you don't need it. Or if you need it, you have to go out and work for it. Or if you can't work for it, you have to find it some other way. And she said there's no such thing as society. And she fundamentally undermined the welfare state. That was bad. But Blair came along and he carried it further. And he said that, for example, that women who didn't go out to work, who took care of their children, were workless. He really meant worthless and people heard it that way. The fact that we have a radical leader, and a, and a leader, this is of the Labour Party, who isn't just radical in terms of public ownership and a programme of redistribution, so not just his policy, but also his methodology and his whole demeanour is one not of, I'm going to do this for you. It's not, some people compare him to Attlee because Attlee had a sort of modesty, but Attlee was a civil servant, really. I'm a servant of the people, but I know what the people need. And all his advisors, Beatrice Webb and so on, they all, they'd got contempt for the ordinary person being able to develop their own plans. Jeremy Corbyn, on the other hand, in a way, his whole political history has been about a belief in the capacities of the people, whether it's the local people fighting for nurseries in his constituency or internationally his support for Kurdish people, Turkish people, Greek people, anybody facing oppression, because he believes that they, in resisting, they also know there is an alternative. So that means it's an opening as well as a, a hope an opening for us, but also a requirement on us to participate and to make things happen. When the movement burst out, you know, a couple of three years ago, we had to begin to rebuild what we had had before. Now people are thinking in much broader terms about more fundamental terms, not made by the state, but funded by the state and made by the population in the community. And I think that is definitely the way to go. And I think as you see it developing, it's women who are taking the lead. <laughs> Hi. Laura Parker Thank was you. Jeremy Corbyn's oh, political secretary for two years before heading up the pro-Corbyn campaign group, Momentum. So what is Momentum? Tell everybody. So Momentum is a campaign group of 40,000 members and rising. It was born around the time of Jeremy Corbyn's first leadership campaign. And essentially, when he won, the several hundred, probably thousand people who'd helped him win decided that they should carry on campaigning. Would it be fair for US audiences to compare Momentum a little bit to the Our Revolution project yes. that spun out of the Sanders campaign? Very much, in as much as I think, like the American experience, we've been bringing people back to politics. We've excited some people who weren't really in politics. We've re-energized people who'd been kind of hanging on in there, but maybe getting a bit disillusioned with party politics as they were. And we actually learned a lot from the Sanders campaign. We had some Sanders volunteers over in the summer, last summer, around our general election in 2017. Um, we've picked up some of their barnstorming techniques. Uh, we've talked to them about digital campaigning. Uh, there's been a bit of mutual support across the Atlantic, I would say. Uh, we've got not dissimilar party leaders, obviously, to old white dudes who, for some bizarre reason, have had this massive appeal to to young and old alike. So we hear a lot about purges in the party and division and 
um, people being expelled if they don't hold the party line as it is under, under Corbyn. Given that that's what some people may have heard if they've heard anything mm. about the Labour Party right now, what do you say? I think that's the established centres of power feeling very uncomfortable about this change. I think I've repeatedly said it's the oldest trick in the book. If you can't defeat the message, if you can't win the political argument, attack. Um, I mean, the Labour Party has got 570,000 people in it. Yeah, there are probably a small number of hardliners. 570,000 people is an awful lot of people to describe them all as sort of purgers or stop Stalinists or trots or... And I mean, as for Jeremy purging people, he's the antithesis of this. You know, people have come back to the Labour Party because there's this quite frankly remarkably ordinary man talking about things that normal people believe in. And I think what's been great about Corbyn is that we've opened up the notion of politics. It doesn't just mean, although it also obviously includes, but it doesn't just mean the narrow world of machine party politics. And I think, you know, in 2018, we have to rethink a little bit how people engage politically. Uh, Bernie Sanders did something that completely broke with American political history. It's the first time that a candidate went way to the top, no funding from the corporate sector, no funding from private wealth, no media support, either ignored or denigrated. He might have won the election, uh, most popular political figure in the country. He talked about socialism, but it meant New Deal, welfare state capitalism. Uh, Corbyn's the same. The Parliamentary Labour Party is dedicated to killing him. Uh, the uh, Guardian, you know, the liberal press, is just carrying out a massive campaign against him. Uh, all kind of crazed charges about anti-Semitism, this, that, and the other thing. They're doing anything they can to undermine him. He's maintaining popular support. Many grassroots activists threw their weight behind Corbyn last year, despite having their differences with some of the party's positions. To get a better grasp of one person's perspective, I spoke with Joshua Virasamy, an organizer with Black Lives Matter UK, which has emerged as the leading voice on issues affecting people of color in Britain. Black Lives Matter UK doesn't have a fixed position on on a parliamentary Labour Party, um, on parties as a whole. Um, what I think we can safely say is that in terms of the kind of transformational change that we want to see in the fabric of society, we don't believe that that can come through parliamentary politics. The fact that um, a lot of progressive people, thinkers, writers, organisers, campaigners, academics are now getting the ear of, of the Labour Party is a very, very um, welcome move. You know, and, and I think that's why we are seeing um, such progressive ideas coming out of the Labour Party around, for example, immigration. In terms of the criminal justice system, it's a real lacklustre approach, you know, because in this country, what we have is a deeply entrenched, deeply entrenched classist and racist issue and sex issue across the criminal justice system, where the disproportionality at times is higher than you have in the USA. The statistics are there, but I don't know why um, the Labour Party is, isn't able to, or feels confident to kind of take these on and champion these these arguments, you know, because this is the communities who who vote for them. When the next general election comes and 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 Corbyn's candidacy is there, I will 100 percent be in the streets cam canvassing for him, campaigning for him and for all um, the MPs who who I believe in in the Labour Party. The question is not about um, being on, wholly on the outside. It's about making sure that you can move the Labour Party further leftwards and, more, and more, make it more progressive um, and make it more inclusive. I'm a Lucian councillor and joined Labour in 2015 to vote for Jeremy Corbyn as party leader. Young activists like Sakina Sheikh, who organised on trade issues as a student, are now getting involved in party politics. I've always been interested in, in the world around me, um, fascinated by political events. My family actually encouraged me to go into dentistry when I was younger. I think immigrant families or migrant families, they have survival in their system, in their DNA. And it was important for them to sort of have economic and social stability, both for themselves and their children. But I couldn't fight who I was. And that was someone who was really motivated by, by justice and, and social justice and outraged by injustice. I pursued law and then I went on to work for various campaigning organizations and be you know, quite politically active. That's kind of culminated me doing my political activism in the Labour Party now. 
I think the Labour Party is evolving back to its roots of socialism and of collectivism. Um, and it's really, really exciting, I think, for people who have been politically active for years and not necessarily politically active in the Labour Party, but people who've been working on the ground, working within communities where perhaps they are more on the front line, working class communities, communities of colour, disabled folk, on issues such as policing um, and immigration where there has been criticisms, that making sure that they're listening to those criticisms. I was recently talking at a local school in Lewisham and there was a, a panel of experts um, and actually the solutions came from the children in, in, the, in the audience and they were predominantly working class black children and they were saying for instance when you're cutting our youth services, when you're cutting our mental health services, when you're cutting local services that allow us spaces to grow and flourish as young people then we are forced out onto the street and actually we also then further feel disempowered when the solutions are given top down and then they don't come from the community. You know, you have some incredible community work happening, um, but the community should not be responsible for having to financially support one another. You know, I think social support, political support can be very empowering within a community, but there needs to be, really frankly, a bigger distribution of wealth in our country. So as a newly elected councillor in Lucian, I am incredibly hopeful and excited about what I can do to contribute to change. Um, I can see change coming and happening already in the way that the Labour Party is moving. I've seen a real mesh of, you know, that, that, that space, that divide, that gap between um, political activism and political institutions become merged. And that's really, really exciting because that's where power really begins to transform for the many and not the few, to use a, a phrase you might have heard. In short, it's what we said in the election, an economy that works for the many not the few. Thank you very much. After hearing so much about the man, I finally got a chance to sit down with Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> so let's start where, where you ended. First, thank you so much for taking some time with us. It's a real pleasure My and an pleasure. honor. We've been traveling a lot and hearing a lot of fears. People are afraid for their lives, for their jobs, for their families, war, environment. Do you share those fears and, and what are yours? Well, I do, and globally there are obviously huge fears about environmental disaster, refugees, uh, and the plight of refugees, and of course war, um, and all the insecurity issues. And even within prosperous societies, there is huge inequality and a great deal of insecurity. And what I used in my speech today was to highlight the mental health issues that are facing this country, and it, Britain is not alone, other countries have the same, and I pointed out that uh, 90 million working days are lost every year in Britain by uh, mental health conditions, and it is the biggest killer of men under 40, uh, young, younger and young men taking their lives through suicide because of mental health stress. And what's that got to do with the economy? Quite a lot, because uh, much of the stress is related to either poverty, desperate poverty, or um, debt, or insecurity, or frozen wages, or reducing wages. And we have a phenomena of uh, increasing use of food banks in Britain, which are a way of people getting some food, by people who are already in work. Mm. And so we've come across situations where nurses working in our National Health Service have to use a food bank in order to survive, and they're in work in the health service. What we're doing is saying we would set up a national investment bank, uh, 500 billion over 10 years, and that would be an investment in crucial infrastructure across the UK. Major railways particularly, but also broadband and uh, uh, access like, uh, like that. But it's also about the regional investment, because what we have in Britain, as you have in the USA, as you have in every part of the world, is an incredible imbalance of what goes on. So you look at the USA, where you've got big economic growth in some parts of California, big economic growth in some parts of the East Coast, other areas, like the Great Lakes region, you've got huge uh, social dislocation problems because of the loss of jobs in the motor industry and the steel industry. Unless you have a combination of a national aspiration to have good communications and good infrastructure and you have a determination to invest locally, then 
you're not going to solve the problem. But if you just say to a global corporation, you come in and do something for us, where are the profits going to go? Are they going to stay in Cleveland or are they going to head off to possibly a tax haven somewhere? So is there still a place? And tax havens are always in hot places, it seems. Is there still a place for redistribution, taxation, that part of the traditional labour model? Yes, of course. And uh, what we've said is that we would increase corporate rates of taxation for the biggest corporations to 26%. At the moment, it's much lower than that. And uh, we would also increase inheritance tax for the very richest. And so there would be a tax change, but we would also be challenging the um, export of profits by a number of companies. This is not a UK phenomenon, it's a worldwide phenomenon, where big, big global corporations uh, have transfer pricing techniques, which means that they get taxed on uh, their profits in low tax uh, regimes. You even have a place for co-ops in your manifesto. Absolutely. Um, co-ops are something that's intrinsic to the British Labour movement. The first um, co-ops were founded by Robert Owen in Scotland at Lanark, but, and also there was the foundation of the cooperative movement in Lancashire with the famous Tubbs Lane Co-op. And co-ops are a big factor. And across the world, they're massive. There's a billion people one in six of the world's populations are either users or members of a co-op of some form. And so what we're saying is, when uh, somebody decides to asset strip their business and uh, simply make the profits out of saying, hang on, you can't do that. You've got to offer it to the workers that have run it and given you the profits you've made out of it. And so we're empowering people. So what we're proposing is national investment, proper taxation for the very richest, and empowerment of communities through local spending, local investment, and empowering people to determine their own lives. Social justice, socialism. You, with your agenda, could be in this position of possibly being, probably being the next prime minister. Is there anything in the model of how you've managed to do this that is replicable, do you think? Or is it totally well, specific? The financial crash happened in 2008 and uh, there was some public ownership of the banking system and there was a bailout there. The problem was that bailout was then paid for by eight years of austerity. We challenged that in the 2017 election. Everybody said, you can't do that. You've got to have austerity. People have got to suffer in order to pay off the debt created by the banking crisis. And we said, no, what has to be done is a better control system in place to prevent it happening again. But above all, that you can't cut your way to prosperity, you invest your way to prosperity. And between 2015 and 2017, support for the Labour Party grew massively in the election. And we ended up, yes, we didn't quite win the election in 2017, but a manifesto that was transformative actually gained an awful lot of support. And our economic conference we're at today is about the values and the ideas and the inspiration of lots of people at the, um, in communities. And what we're now doing is a uh, long series of local community meetings. So you take a town, take a city and say, you know, we lost our steel industry, we lost this manufacturing plant, we lost that. What do we need? Nearly always they say they need better communications, either digital, railway or road and they need the opportunity to invest for the future and use the skills that are there. So it's a bottom-up plan. Of course there are going to be complications and contradictions within it, but we also have the national framework, the National Investment Bank, Regional Investment Bank, and a national education service. So education stops being a commodity to be bought and sold. It's there as a right, just like healthcare. You've come to power with an awful lot of movement support. How, what are you putting in place to ensure that when you are in power, you don't get kind of captured by the usual way of doing things? I think that's a very, very important and very profound question, if I may say so, because uh, clearly once you're in office, you, you have to make decisions day to day, and some of those decisions are inevitably going to be complicated and difficult. So you have to have a democracy in process at a local level as well as a national level and within your party and within your movement that holds people to account. And what John McDonnell and I often say, it's not when I win an election, it's when we win the election. It's empowering of people. And 
you know what? It's very exciting and it's brought an awful lot of people of all ages, it's not just young people, all ages, into political activity and political life. And Labour is now the largest political party in Europe as a result of that. So any word of inspiration to your friends in the US? Thank you for that great radical tradition in the USA, which I've always admired, that radical tradition that opposed the Vietnam War, that radical tradition that brought the Civil Rights Act, that radical tradition that has stood up for people in the worst of all circumstances, and the way that all came together around the, um, those traditions all came together around the Bernie Sanders, um, the Bernie Sanders campaign. And so I see our friendship and our relationship as with that spirit of American communities and that determination to bring people together and oppose racism and oppose xenophobia and oppose all the horrors that go with that. People together are very powerful. People divided are very weak. For more from the UK on labor and its economic plans, check out our special feature on community wealth building in Preston or read my article in The Nation magazine. That's it from us this time. If you enjoy this programming, support it with a donation at lauraflanders.org. And thank you.